Hello, it is Phylum Arthropoda, and I want to welcome you to this lesson nine. Uh, we are discussing animal kingdom, and we have now moved to Phylum Arthropoda. These are literally called creatures with jointed legs. Well, did you know that arthropods contain more species than any other phylum, meaning they are the majority? There are very many arthropods than any other phylum in the kingdom Animalia. And then under phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta has more species than any other class under phylum Arthropoda. So there are very many insects. Uh, insects have been very successful, of course, and uh, what has helped them to, uh, to survive in different habitats is their adaptation to exploit almost every habitat. They can be in water, there are insects on land, there are those that burrow in the soil, there are those that fly, and many other. In, in fact, they have undergone what we call adaptive radiation, development of structures in order to live in different habitats. Uh, well, uh, looking at Arthropoda, or Phylum Arthropoda, there are reasons or what we call diagonistic features that uh, describe arthropods. These are features that are used to differentiate arthropods from other organisms. Uh, there are majorly three. There are majorly three diagonistic features. The first one is they have jointed appendages for feeding. Uh, they also use those appendages for locomotion and for sensory purposes. Uh, we are talking about the limbs, the antennae, the mouth parts. Those are the jointed what? Appendages. And then two, they have exoskeleton. All arthropods have an external skeleton called exoskeleton that is made up of uh, a substance called chitin, a polysaccharide called chitin. So we call it a chitinous uh, skeleton, a chitinous cuticle. And then they have segmented bodies. They have segments at least somewhere in their bodies. So arthropods can be distinguished from the rest of uh, organisms by having jointed appendages, exoskeleton, and segmented what? Bodies. So if you see an organism that has those three, then you can easily qualify them to be arthropods. However, they also have other characteristics that they share with the other organisms. The, fir the first one there being their tripoblastic silomates. Now you know at least what uh, a, tripo a tripoblastic organism is that, that has three germ layers. The ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And then they are also, they have a true silom. So they are called silomates. And then they exhibit bilateral body symmetry. At least we have seen this one. Where an organism can be divided into two equal parts, and those parts are mirror images of each other. So all arthropods, look at the grasshopper, the cockroach, the spiders, they have bilateral body symmetry. They also exhibit metameric body segmentation. The body is, uh, the body has segments, at least well-defined segments. That's what we call metameric segmentation. And then the silom uh, is much reduced, however, in the arthropods. And the main body cavity is what we call the hemocele. And uh, as these organisms develop, when they become mature, most of them, the hemocele uh, it becomes is a fluid, a blood cavity, or uh, a fluid-filled cavity that serves as blood. Actually, the blood in the arthropods is the hemocele. So this, these organisms have the more of the hemocele and that has substituted the true silom, the, the silomic fluid that uh, other organisms have. So instead of the silomic fluid, most of it now is what we call the hemocele. Um, arthropods, however, have a very high risk of losing blood because their blood does not flow in blood vessels. They have an open saturatory what? system. And where blood just pours, the, the hemocele, uh, pours into the body cavity and uh, without defined roots. 
Therefore, in case of any injury, there can be a lot of blood lost that can even lead to loss of life. Uh, well, the high blood volume in arthropods enables them to maintain a high metabolic rate, which allows them to be very active animals. Of course, you must have seen uh, arthropods flying, moving here and there, cockroaches moving up and down, grasshoppers, and all the other arthropods, mosquitoes, and so on. They are capable of being very active. And uh, what has made them to become like that is because of having a higher uh, metabolic rate producing enough energy to enable them to move in and about their environments. However, there are some disadvantages which are associated with the, the presence of the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is found in uh, all arthropods, but uh, to some extent there are some challenges that it poses. The first one is uh, <clears throat> its weight to strength ratio decreases with the size of the animal making it less efficient as the animal becomes larger. So you may realize that larger animals, of course, have a very heavier exoskeleton, and those animals are usually less active because of that challenge. The weight to strength ratio of the, it limits their strength and activity as the exoskeleton grows bigger. And then the other one is it also resists growth, uh, especially when the exoskeleton hardens it limits the organism's expansion ability. So if an organism wants to expand, if an arthropod wants to grow, what does it do? It has to shed off the exoskeleton, what we call molting. It has to molt, to remove the exoskeleton so as to allow the body to increase in size. Yeah, so that is only uh, possible when the exoskeleton is removed. However, when the exoskeleton matures or hardens again, then growth is limited. The other one is during molting, the body of the arthropod is uh, soft and therefore very vulnerable and susceptible to damage. So that's another danger of having exo exoskeleton. It's only important when it's there. When it's not there, the organism is exposed to a lot of damage. So let's look at the different classes under phylum arthropoda. The first one is class Crustacea. Those members can be called the Crustaceans. And uh, you must have heard some of them, the crayfish, the lobsters, the water fleas, the Daphnia, and others. So those are uh, some of the members of class Crustacea. Some of them, most of them actually are, are, are aquatic, or actually marine, some of them are marine, they live in water, others live in fresh water, although there are some, I think it's only one species called wood lice that lives on land. It is the only terrestrial crustacean, but the rest of the crustaceans uh, live in water. However, most of them are mobile, they move, they are capable of locomoting. However, there is a, a certain species called the barnacles, and that is the, the species of Crustaceans that is static, that is sessile, it cannot move. It, is, it just gets attached into the substratum in the sea. So those are the members there. You can see the crab. Uh, probably you might have seen that one. The lobsters, uh, the crayfish there. Uh, the barnacles, you can see them attached to the surface underwater. Those ones that are, are the only sessile Crustaceans, the only crustaceans that cannot move, that cannot locomote, sorry. Uh, the characteristics include the following. One, they have two pairs of antennae. So that means the crustaceans have four antennae, two pairs, those are four. And then they have a pair of compound eyes, and then uh, those are two eyes. They are gaseous exchange by means of gills, because of course they live in water, so the gills would be the most suitable compared to the, the, the tracheal system which exists in other arthropods. The tracheal system would not be effective uh, in water. The gills would be more effective and that's why they use them for gaseous exchange. They have three pairs of mouth parts, the jaws. They have the, the maxillae, two pairs of the maxillae, but for the case of the crustaceans, 
the maxillae are called the max the maxillule so they have two pairs of the maxillule and then they have one pair of mandibles and they use for cutting food and then most of them are aquatic of course apart from the wood lice remember we talked of, talked about the wood lice the only terrestrial uh crustacean that is known so far that is common the rest are aquatic they live in water and then when you look at their body structure properly you realize that the head and the thorax cannot be distinguished they look like one combined structure so that kind of setting is what we call the cephalothorax so they have uh, a cephalothorax a combination of a head and the, the thorax so those are the crustaceans. Let's look at uh, another class of arthropods called the chilopods or class chilopoda. Of course, the, the commonest and the most well-known example or member of the chilopod class is the lithobias, the one you call the centipede. This one is very common in most of our habitats. Yeah, so it is a terrestrial and mainly carnivorous. It feeds on small uh, insects and other organisms. And then uh, it has a clearly defined head, uh, but the all, all other body parts are similar. It has very many segments which look the same, but at least you can tell the head from the rest of the segments. That's what we call a clearly defined head. And then they possess one pair of antennae. That means, unlike the crustaceans, the chilopods for them, they have one pair of antennae. Remember, the crustaceans have two pairs of antennae. The chilopods have only one, meaning they have only two antennae. And of course, the antenna is used for sensitivity. And then uh, they also possess one pair of mouth parts, the mandibles, or we can call it the jaws, which are used for biting, They're used for defense and also for uh, cutting the prey. And then uh, they have uh, uh, simple eyes. Uh, they don't have compound eyes. They have numerous identical legs. They have very many legs. Actually, on each segment, there is one pair of legs. So if the, you, you count it, the number of segments times two, that would be the number of legs. So there are very many. Remember the segments range from between 12 and around 15 there. So that means the legs can be about 30 to 40 uh, legs. Uh, well, they don't have a larval form. So they just develop from an egg to some substantive adult. Then eventually it grows into the adult. There is no larval form. And then uh, they use the tracheal system for their agriculture exchange. So they have... A, a, a network of crisscrossing tubes called the tracheal system that moves respiratory gases between the environment and the tissues. So you can see there uh, the members of Kilas uh, chilopoda, uh, very beautiful members there. You can see they are called the centipedes. So let's look at another class called the class diplopoda. From the word die, then plopoda, die means two pairs of legs per segment. Well, these are quite closer to the chilopoda, but for them they have more legs. It means on each segment, there will be two pairs of legs. And the most common member is the millipede, the terrestrial millipede. You have probably seen this one under the leaves and very cold places like that. So, they are mainly terrestrial. You can see them, like I've told you, under the leaves of cold trees, like under mango trees. You can find them there. And they can easily coil when you touch them. Those are the millipedes. And when they are walking majestically, like a train, with very many legs and very long, very beautiful. Um, they are mainly herbivorous. So, if you compare them with the chilopods, we say chilopods are, are carnivores. They are carnivorous. They feed on a I live a prey. They hunt and kill the prey and then they feed on special insects, uh, small insects like the ants. Then the diplopods in this case do not feed on 
the other organisms, the, the other living organisms. They feed on majorly plant. They don't feed on animals, other animals. They feed on plant. So that's why they are called the herbivores. They feed on dead leaves, uh, decomposing leaves, uh, dry leaves, and some fresh leaves, and some plant matter. That's what they feed on. And that, of course, defines their habitat. That's where they live. Where there is their food. And then the head is also distinct. Uh, they have very many segments which are similar, but you can easily tell the head, just like the chilopods. One pair of mouth parts, the mandibles, and one pair of antennae as well. And they have, uh, they have also simple eyes. Uh, they have numerous identical legs. With no with the two pairs per segment which means each, each segment has two pairs of legs they also don't have the larval form and the just like the the, the chilopods they also have the tracheal system or gaseous exchange so they have very many similarities with the with the chilopods i think apart from a few like uh, um being they are being herbivorous the chilopods are carnivores and also having two pairs of legs per segment uh, as com uh, compared to the chilopods that have one pair per segment so you can see them there those are the millipedes um, very beautiful organisms there when you touch them they coil that is one of the uh, measures they use for protecting themselves against predators uh, great Let's look at another class, Arachnida. These are the Arachnids. And of course, you must have been wondering where the ticks, the scorpions, the spiders belong. Those belong to class Arachnida or the Arachnids. So you have seen, which one haven't you seen before? I know you have ever seen a spider. That one which makes cobwebs in the house or in your classroom. The mites, the ticks, and then... Have you ever seen the scorpion? Well, it looks like that. However, there are a number of species of scorpions, but that is their basic body structure. Uh, they are majorly, majorly terrestrial as well, and they are also carnivorous. Uh, now you know these terms, what they mean. I already explained them earlier. They have two main body parts, that is the cephalothorax and the abdomen. The cephalothorax, remember we said, is a, a, a combined part of the thorax and the, and the head. It is an indistinguishable part. You cannot distinguish the head from the thorax. So it's combined. And we, we term it biologically as cephalothorax. They don't have antennae, however, but they have modified limbs for, for sensitivity. Uh, they don't have true mouth parts, but a pair of appendages are used for capturing the prey and uh, a second pair is used for sensory pulps that's what we're looking that's what, what we're talking about they have the sensory pulps for sensitivity as opposed to the antennae in some organisms they also have simple eyes uh, which are which, which they have they don't have the compound eyes they don't have the larval forms for them they also develop from the egg to a sub to uh, to a, 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 to a young adult and then to a mature adult so they don't have a love a, a love of form and then they undergo gaseous exchange and they, unlike the others they also they use the lung or the gill books although some of them use the trachea the trachea system for gaseous exchange let's look at another class class insecta this one is the most popular class under phylum Arthropoda. There are more insects than any other class. And this is, can be witnessed in your compound. At least everywhere you can see an insect. In your house, flying around, even in water, there are some insects. On land, there are those that burrow, like the termites and so on. But before we look at them in detail, let's look at their di diagonistic features. What do we use? To separate them from other organisms well there are three major features the first one is when you get an insect it has three main body divisions or three main body parts that is to say the head the thorax and the abdomen 
they have three main body parts the head thorax and then the what the abdomen and then they also have three pairs of jointed legs three pairs of jointed legs so how many legs are those six they have six legs and those legs are found on the thorax they are all attached on the thorax and then they also have three thoracic segments the thorax is divided into three segments the first segment near the head is called the prothorax then the one in the middle is called the mesothorax and the one near the abdomen is called the metathorax so there are three thoracic segments and in each segment there is a pair of legs attached so three thoracic segments each segment with one pair of legs so there are three pairs of legs so those are the diagonistic features meaning if you saw those three characteristics in an organism then you may conclude that it is an insect so you can see from there it has the head uh, the thorax and then the what the abdomen and then you can also see the three thoracic segments in this next uh, picture and then you can see the three pairs of legs there however insects also have other characteristics that they exhibit and of course these characteristics are not diagonistic just because they can be shared by other organisms as well for example insects are terrestrial that means mainly most of the insects you can find them on land however there are some few aquatic insects and then they don't have gills in the adult however some um, aquatic species of insects have gills in their larval forms and then they have compound eyes there are insects that have compound eyes although there are some that may have simple eyes or even others don't have eyes completely but generally we could say insects have compound what eyes and then they have usually three pairs of mouth parts the mandibles then the maxillae and and then we have the gaseous exchange also takes place through the trachea which of course opens to the outside through the the spiracles so we have the spiracles that connect to the tracheal system through the crisscrossing tubes called the trachea that serve the entire body of the organism and then uh, they have metamorphosis their life cycles undergo what we call metamorphosis which can be either complete or incomplete as we shall see there are some insects that undergo complete metamorphosis that have egg larva pupa and then adult then there are those that have egg nymph and then adult we shall see uh, later on and then we have the subclass there are two subclasses we have subclass apterygota uh, that class the apterygota uh, includes some of the insects that we shall see and these ones are majorly insects that don't have wings and they include uh, the silverfish the silverfish is that insect that is found usually in the kitchen you can see it on the wall um, it is different from it's not silverfish silver fish is mukene that one with those are two words silver then fish this one is silver fish and this is an insect uh, usually it's a very small insect which doesn't have wings and usually found in uh, you can find them in the kitchen or in the carpentry shops like that um or bathrooms you can also find them there they like damp damp areas and then we have another class called uh the pterygota uh, these ones have wings so all insects that have wings belong to phylum i mean subclass pterygota and then those that don't have wings belongs to subclass of pterygota okay so let's see uh, this phylum that has wings the phylum pterygota can also be divided into two groups we have the first group called exopterygota and uh, these ones the wings develop externally that is one characteristic they have so you, their, their wings are developed externally and then they also undergo incomplete metamorphosis meaning they are hemimetabolous and then examples include the, the locusts and then the cockroaches the, uh, the dragonflies yeah those ones belong to file uh, group 
exopterygota. Their wings develop ex, uh, externally. Then we have endopterygota. Their wings develop internally. And these members undergo complete metamorphosis, meaning for them, they develop from the egg to larva, pupa, and then to adult. They undergo complete metamorphosis. And uh, their larval stages are usually specialized for eating and uh, growing. That is what they do majorly. You know the caterpillars. Also, that is a very representative species there of uh, the larval stage that is very destructive. They feed a lot and also grow before they later on retreat and uh, complete their life cycle. They are known by such names as caterpillars, of course you know those ones. And then uh, the adults are usually specialized for dispersal and reproduction. And examples here include the butterfly, uh, the honeybee, the houseflies, and so on. Those ones belong to group endopterygota. Uh, yes, they undergo complete metamorphosis. Well, let's proceed. Uh, with other orders of insects we want to look at the orders of insects why, why are we continuing to the order level of classification for the phylum insecta is because it's a popular phylum i mean it's a popular it's a popular class that has very many orders and we say that insects are the majority of arthropods so we'd like to even look at their orders uh, briefly there are very many orders but we're going to look at a few that uh, economically important to man. Examples, uh, let's look at, the first one is order orthoptera, and these ones include the crickets, the grasshoppers, and then there's an insect called the walking sticks. These ones, uh, they have chewing mouth parts, of course you know the grasshopper, it can even chew the leaves, and so on. They have straight wings, you can refer to the one for the grasshopper. They also undergo uh, while well, some undergo incomplete metamorphosis, there are some that undergo complete metamorphosis. And then we have uh, two pairs of wings, uh, with the front wings being narrow and leathery, and then the inner wings are usually folded and broad, used for flying. The outer wings are for protection. Then we have, uh, yes, we have already talked about that. So we can see there the members of uh, order Orthoptera, as you can see. We have the grasshopper, the crickets, and then that insect there is called the walking stick. I don't know whether you have ever seen it. Usually found in green plants, and you can always see it. Uh, you can not easily differentiate it from grass, and is one of the ways it uses for protecting itself. Camouflage and the mimicry. It mimics the, the environment of grass and leaves, so you cannot easily uh, differentiate it. And you cannot easily identify it. And then we have another order called Order Dictoptera. These ones include the cockroaches. Uh, you already know these ones. And then the mantids, like the praying mantis. Uh, yes, so let's go through them faster, their characteristics. They are dorsal ventrally flattened. You must have seen the cockroach. That the dorsal side, the back and the ventral side, are compressed to form a very flat surface so the body is flat and this of course enables them to fit into small cracks and crevices and also between peppers where the cockroaches always live they undergo uh, incomplete metamorphosis you have seen them the life cycle of the cockroach we looked at it in our senior one you remember the cockroach develops from the egg to the nymph and then to the adult However, the nymph has other stages, uh, nympho stages, before it reaches the adult. Uh, they have two pairs of wings. They will have the outer wing or the forward wing, which is usually dark and uh, hardened for protection. Then the inner wings, which are usually uh, folded and uh, membranous, which are used for flight. Uh, yes. We can see the members there of uh, of order Dictoptera. You see the insect, uh, the the cockroaches, uh, the praying mantis there, and then the other mantids there. Well, let's look at another order. Order Isoptera, and these ones have uh, uh, the members 
majorly the termites, which I know you are very familiar with. They have chewing mouth parts, and then we have uh, very many kests, like the workers and the soldiers that don't have the wings. And then we have the winged termites, the ones you call the white ants. They undergo incomplete metamorphosis, and then uh, their reproduction, uh, the, those ones that reproduce possess two pairs of similar membranous wings. Those are the white ants, which eventually develop into the queen termite, uh, the one the Baganda called the Namunswa. So you can have a look at them there. You see the soldier termite there, you've seen the queen termite there below that large member. Then we have the winged termites, the ones we call the, the white ants, which are a delicacy for many Ugandans. Uh, they are eaten. Then we have another order called Hemiptera, which majorly has all members of the bugs and their relatives. They have piercing and sucking mouth parts, and they have uh, some of them have two pairs of membranous wings. And then we have order Homoptera. These ones majorly the aphids and their relatives, and they have piercing and sucking mouth parts. They uh, have uh, some of them have incomplete metamorphosis. Others have complete metamorphosis. Uh, some species can reproduce without mating. You remember pathogenesis. Uh, some of them exhibit that, and then some are wingless, however others may possess membranous wings for flight. So you can see the aphids there. You usually find them in the leguminous plants, like the peas. You find them below the leaves, sucking the juice from the leaves. And sometimes in some big plants, the aphids can invade and suck, and the, the plant begins dripping water down. So if you see that, you be observant. You, it may be aphids that are invading that plant. And then we have other hymenoptera, where we have the ants, the, the wasps, the bees, and their relatives. These ones have chewing and uh, lapping mouth parts. They are those that chew, others lap. And then uh, the worker ants and a few others don't have wings. Uh, they have... However, others have two pairs of wings, like the, bee, the bees have wings, two pairs of wings, and then um, the front wings are larger than the hind wings for those that have wings, and then they also undergo complete metamorphosis, growing from the egg to larva, pupa, and then to adult. So you can have a look at uh, some of the members of the order Hymenoptera. You can see the bee there. And then the wasps there and their relatives. We shall. Uh, so let's look at another order, Lepidoptera, where we have the butterflies and their relatives, the moth. These members undergo complete metamorphosis, where they grow from the egg to larva, the caterpillar, and then to pupa, and then to adult. The pupa, sometimes called the silkworm. And then we have. They have the sucking mouth parts, which are shaped like a coil, a coiled tube for sucking. Usually when they are sucking, that is sucking mouth part elongates, and they insert it into the flowers for sucking the nectar or the juice. And then after sucking, they fold it, and then they fly away. Uh, their front wings are usually larger than the hind wings, and then they, they possess pairs of usually broad wings, which possess scales. They have scaly, uh, scaly wings. You have seen the the scales of the of the moth, usually undesirable sometimes. And then we have uh, the examples there. As you can see, the butterfly usually has brighter colors compared to the moth. And then the larva stage there is a the the, the, the the caterpillar. Quite a difference between the larval stage and the adult. Well, but that's why metamorphosis is very important. This one undergoes metamorphosis and changes into the adult. So it changes the shape completely. So let's look at another order, Diptera. These ones include the house flies, mosquitoes, and their relatives. Uh, they have the following characteristics. They have two large compound eyes 
they have piercing mouth parts some of them have sucking mouth parts uh, they undergo complete metamorphosis and then their two front wings are transparent the 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 the, the, the four wings are transparent and uh, the two hind wings are reduced to halters which are used for balancing during flight so they are meant to have two pairs of wings but one pair of wings is reduced to form the organs of balance for the halters so you can see the members there of uh, order diptera the housefly the mosquitoes and their relatives there uh, however there are some few facts about uh, this order that we may need to know uh, you know that the flies can see behind them yes it's true when you look at the, the position of their eyes they can look almost 360 degrees and then uh, it's only the female mosquitoes that can bite animals especially man so the mosquitoes that suck blood from you that disturb you at night are majorly female the males are well adapted to suck plant juices and not blood and uh, the mosquito as per now are still the world's most deadliest animals did you know that uh, there are more people that die of malaria than any other disease so that's that makes the mosquito the most deadly animal in the world currently probably you you would be undermining you would think maybe the lions and the what but there are more people that succumb to mosquitoes than to other animals that you may see fierce um, mosquitoes love carbon dioxide and the, one of the ways they use for locating uh, you when you are sleeping is by following your carbon dioxide direction so as you breathe out the carbon dioxide saturates and the mosquitoes are able to follow the direction where the carbon dioxide is coming from and eventually they find out where you are and then they suck the blood and then they usually don't live long they live for a few days uh, before they die so we can look at another phylum there I'm sorry another order order odonata and these ones uh, majorly the dragonflies and their relatives and uh, these ones have chewing mouth parts they have two pairs of equal sized transparent membranous wings that cannot be folded and then they have huge eyes very large compound eyes they possess very small antennae but very sensitive either their legs cannot walk but they are used to capture the prey when they're in air actually these members the dragonflies are excellent in flying excellent in flying they can turn almost all directions and they can capture their prey in air very very interesting there and then they can also mate when they are flying and then they exhibit incomplete metamorphosis so you can see there you must have seen that member the dragonfly they have excellent flying skills yeah that can even enable them to mate when they are flying and to capture prey in air then we have order Siphnoptera. these ones have the flea the fleas probably you must have seen the flea species and so you might have suffered from uh, the, the wrath of some of them however there are over 200 and 2500 species of fleas currently in the world and some of them are actually most of them are parasites of mammals and birds and they consume blood that kind of feeding is called hematophagy the habit of feeding on blood is called hemato, hematophagy. So the fleas conduct that kind of uh, feeding. And uh, other characteristics include they don't have wings. They are wingless. They also don't have eyes. But they have other sense organs that enable them to detect where the, 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 the prey or the host is. And then they, they also exhibit incomplete metamorphosis but they possess piercing mouth parts apologies for the graphic images but wanted to show you 
some of the devastating effects of the flea. For example, the jigger flea that uh, brings about jiggers. Uh, well, 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 well. Very distracting there. So that's how they look like. Fleas have very beautiful images there and very good shape. They have usually very long hind limbs that enables them to jump and find the prey. One of the adaptations is uh, they have hind limbs that are longer and very sharp piercing mouth parts for piercing the prey. Then the hind limbs for jumping. Some of the facts about the fleas include uh, uh, when you are treating the fleas, you don't only remove them from the animals, but you also treat the environment because and fleas live in the environment. So if you are removing them, you are spraying the pigs or the goats, it's not enough. You have to spray even the habitat where they stay for you to remove the, the fleas. And then uh, the fleas being parasites, opportunistic parasites, are able to live for so long without eating. They can live for about 14 days without feeding. So they have a very good parasitic adaptation there. But when they find the prey or the host, then they will eventually feed to the maximum and even increase in size. Uh, a female flea, a flea can lay up to 50 eggs per day during the breeding season. So within a short time, Within a short time, they have multiplied and increased in number because they have a very high reproductive rate. And then uh, fleas have Olympic caliber jumping skills. They can jump to up to 150 times of their height. So if you were to, to jump like that, you would jump over your classroom block. Surely you would really win a gold medal in Olympics. So if you were a flea, you would be undisputed champion of high jump. So fleas can jump very high, up to 150 times their length or their height. That is how they are able to find the prey. I mean the yeah, the prey or the hosts. So when the animals are moving around where the fleas are, they just jump and stick into them and then they begin. Otherwise, it would be so hard for them to find the, the, the hosts. Fleas can transmit some diseases, for example, plague. Uh, so when you have fleas around, they are not only dangerous to other animals, but also to man. So, and it's also said that they can transport or transmit tapeworm eggs, uh, so they can pass them to other animals. So members, I want to thank you very much for being very good students. I want to encourage you now to summarize uh, the different classes we have looked at, summarize their characteristic, and also summarize the, the members that are found in that class. And then when we reach to class in sector, at least we will summarize the characteristics of different orders that are found, in, and then also the members that are found there. Then you will be a very good uh, member in studying uh, a, a class at Phylum Arthropoda, and then the classes. Otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, be blessed and stay safe.